Hi everyone. Um, I apologize for not being here yesterday. I think I won the furthest distance travel to come here, but I'm here. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'll. I think this talk was originally offered to Professor Larry Smar to talk about the networking, and I'm a copy eye on a couple of the projects together with Larry. I'll talk about those later on, but first I'll talk a little bit about why we are using this, and you know, a little about me. I spent the last 18 years at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Uh, I manage, uh, or I'm the division director for our uh, research and development division. Uh, my work. Uh, work has been in workflow systems and provenance, data provenance and reproducibility over the years. Um, if you know of Kepler workflow system, that's been one of our products. But at the supercomputer center right now, we have um, two major supercomputers along with a Condo Colo cluster uh, facility. Uh, one of them is the Gordon flash-based supercomputer, which was the first flash-based supercomputer. Uh, now uh, it's owned by a private institute uh, in its post-NSF life, uh, and they do a lot of different computations on it for the next couple of years. Uh, and uh, Comet supercomputer system is uh, the secret sauce, and this is the virtualized HPC, bit, which means um, you can have different software stacks and have many smaller supercomputers in uh, one supercomputer uh, to respond to different workloads. One of the motivations behind that was we noticed a lot of the jobs that was going that were going through were what we call the long tail jobs with 1,000 cores or less. Uh, and they needed variety of software stacks, especially with the big data workloads. So in Comet now, you can have a software stack uh, and create a virtualized cluster, so to say, with the same interconnect and come up with uh, a smaller supercomputer out of uh, what's there. And it's a heterogeneous cluster with uh, InfiniBand nodes and GPUs, a really powerful GPUs, so quite a large number of GPUs. I couldn't come up with the number in my head right now. Uh, and like we've seen, I didn't know we had uh, four petabytes of storage in the uh, facility. A relatively new happening at UCSD is uh, we had a large donation, $75 million, from uh, an alum uh, who was one of the first people at Facebook. Uh, and after that donation, the university stood up an academic unit called Halujolo Data Center. Halujolo is the surname of uh, the donor, HDSI. Um, so it's our very new software institute. It's a year old, almost. Um, and the idea is it's going to have an academic unit that works across the campus and it will have its own undergrad and graduate program along with uh, the research uh, or, uh, organization characteristics. So it's a mix between an institute and a department, so we are trying a new model there. And Definitely, there are cross-cutting areas, uh, theoretical and experimental data science scenarios, and uh, we are looking forward to partnerships with uh, others outside of UCSD on this. And also, since 2015, uh, I've been leading the data science hub at uh, uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center. Now it's becoming a hub for uh, both SDSC and HDSI, uh, and that was thought of as, you know, co data science is really collaborative and we have a lot of users at the Supercomputer Center at that time who were trying to cross the boundaries of computational science and data science and do, you know, data-driven simulations or closed-loop simulations. And we had a number of industry contacts for, uh, or projects for data-driven uh, work along with, um, you know, a workforce training program at that time. So it brought these together and brought it under an umbrella that we could actually bring together researchers with opportunities in data science and also create data and compute platforms to match the needs there. Uh, it's nicely growing. Uh, I always look at this figure and say, if data science is a new religion, what's its temple? I think a lot of people are trying to figure it out with all those industries and uh, institutes and centers and departments being found. Uh, it was actually a number of them listed on your slides as well. But so a common theme here is definitely um, in science and 
outside of science. Actually, we are dealing with the world. We have a lot of data. Um, in the scientific scenarios, also computational sciences, or you know, in business, we can refer to as the business experience or expertise. Data science, cyber infrastructure, as in storage, computing, networking facilities. But most importantly, uh, their applications. Right? Uh, without applications and collaborations around these applications, it's really uh, hard to imagine any of these being useful. And in these applications, often, uh, big data needs to be utilized together with scalable computing. And that's why we are talking about data science, actually. We have the ability to get more data about ourselves, our environment, anything that actually we can think of. And we have now ability to compute on these data sets in a scalable way, you know, through edge computing, cloud computing, and traditional supercomputing or cluster computing facilities. And I think there's an opportunity there that's really intriguing for all of us that it enables data-driven dynamic actions. Uh, if it's a simulation, it's to drive the simulation or learn from it or reduce things on the fly. Uh, if it's a business application to really do just-in-time computing or understanding from the data that we can drive actions. Um, and when you look at that, a lot of the older fields like manufacturing and medicine and even the city is, they have these add-ons in the front. Right? They have smart, personalized, uh, precision. You know, these are words that smart means there's a sensor somewhere that you're reading from and know, doing something with that information. Precision or customization of information or personalization of information means we are doing it for a specific entity or about the specific things that thing that we are collecting data on. And once we can use these correctly, uh, there's the opportunity of taking all these different, you know, sort of big data, let's say massive raw image data, and uh, a lot of HPC resources or power, computational power that we can uh, use and do something with it. Maybe these days we are taking imagery and applying uh, training uh, neural networks on that and coming up with some more information about these imagery or we can on the fly label things. So when you do that, it becomes a part of this high value zone I refer to as. Right? Uh, you val amplify the value and suddenly the maybe use of computing and you know amount of data drops for but people who can use it, what you can do with it, and understanding from that data expands. So that's how I define actually the value. By doing uh, analysis of large data set using large computing, are we having more people take advantage of this data? Are we making uh, know, understanding from these data sets uh, better or creating an increasing under, increased understanding? Or are we even actually able to look at the data differently so it inspires new problems? So that's how I would define and that, that makes the data actionable in the long term. The other part of it is once you start understanding from these large data of uh, improve the understanding of these large data sets, uh, are they applicable to problems that can benefit something? It could be scientific, it can be societal, it could be educational. You know, in the end, what we want to do is uh, create value out of data and use it to benefit something. For instance, in our work, we collected existing data sets related to wildfires and turned those into maps. That even inspires a lot of people to start using that, those data sets in different ways. But we also took those bits and used it for closed loop simulations of the wildfire behavior. And something that lasted three, four hours, now we can do it in a matter of minutes and give it to the authorities, or they can do it, more importantly, to the community who could use these data sets and simulations suddenly expanded because we prepare these automated curation protocols and automated workflows in the background that can actually uh, create the scalable modeling of the wildfire and learn from the ongoing fire. So I think we can expand these scenarios, but once we had that, we definitely thought the fire authorities, when they're managing the fire, can benefit from it. It becomes another bit of information for decision support. But what happened is 8 million people, 
or 800,000 people, sorry, last year with 8 million, more than 8 million page hits in the fall 2017 fires in, San, uh, in California, throughout California, accessed this data site, sites for uh, situational awareness. So suddenly it was also like this massive public impact that we didn't advertise or expect. So then the question becomes, can we amplify the value of data related to X? X could be any problem and use that amplified value to benefit Y. So how do we go from X to Y and how do we create uh, data pipelines and infrastructure, so to say, to create that X and Y uh, in different scenarios. And here I think focusing on the problems to solve is the key because each problem comes with its own requirements on this infrastructure and the infrastructure needs to be scalable to uh, respond to those requirements. So one of another uh, use case that we are actually working on now is we are looking at um, sea spray aerosols. These are basically when the sea uh, waves happen. They, they are small particles that go into the sea spray and they have actually protein in them. They are not like just nasty, I mean they have chemicals but they are actually active and they do something to the environment. If you can understand the dynamics of uh, these particles, we can tell, tell, uh, tell more about you know, our climate and uh, environmental conditions around it. So when you look at this, there's definitely understanding what's going on in there, it's molecular dynamics scenarios, but systems more than the traditional drug design systems, bigger scale. Um, we have data analysis or large scale PCA and clustering we have some high throughput computing uh, with Markov state uh, optimizations. Um, and we have the continuous data and integration and transformation that feeds back to experimental design. There are facilities that generate these and there are also experimental uh, work that's going on with uh, the groups. But what we also wanted to do is, um, can we do it in a way that we constantly learn from what we are doing and turn those into educational uh, sort of content for the students to understand from. Can we distill what we can teach about what's going on here as well, both the students and the public. And when you look at just what was drawn on the board there, uh, and this is my rough calculations on the other board next to it, uh, just one iteration was like one million core hours. So these things are actually massively uh, expensive when you compute this part of it. But these parts will relate to taking advantage of uh, other types of computing platforms. Maybe not as large scale, but it needs to be done in a way that's integrated. If you draw that right, what's going on there is actually uh, you experiment uh, and select interesting chemistry, prepare the data, do some molecular dynamics workflows and learn from them and analyze and store. There's this constant loop that uh, goes on to do this right. And uh, so when you look at that, we had some MD workflows, molecular dynamics workflows that was done in uh, the Kepler toolkit <coughs> a while back. And it's going to take reuse of that. So parts of it is there. Right? When you look at this figure, each part, there is some work on it, uh, prior work on it. How do we take that work and make it applicable to this? How can we then use existing work as a service that we know how to run on different infrastructure systems? You know, the MD workflows, parts of it will require GPUs, parts of it won't. Uh, but then <clears throat> when there are other clusters that we can compute, if there is a strong enough network, actually you can network these computers and move the data around without having to worry about where these uh, computers are or you know, doing everything on the same computer in the first place. So it's an application integration effort, but for that application integration to be right, you need to do some other things right. Um, so what goes on in this application integration effort? First of all, there's all kinds of scientific and technological expertise. You know, the way I explained it, I'm having a hard time explaining it, right? When I explain it to my 11-year-old son, I say, you know, what we are trying to do is 
we are trying to send a massive drug to the cloud so it can fix itself. That's the ultimate, right? That's actually what's going on there. But if you were to ask me anything about the you know, molecular dynamics or the physics of it, or the, what's like selecting interesting chemistry it, I'll take, okay, you know, now I have to think about it or ask somebody. But I understand it to the point enough that how these things should come together and what I need to know about it. As a technologist, I need to know about performance, accuracy, and things like that, and be able to communicate that to the science partners. And they need to also be able to communicate that, what they need from running those uh, applications that are integrating. Um, so uh, I can relate to it. I can relate to the problem and the importance of why this solution needs to be there, or the whole team should. So there's definitely multidisciplinary expertise and there's a culture around it that needs to be happened. Many skills of computing, uh, even in that computing domain, we don't have expertise on all skills. You know, that might even have multiple people there. Um, begin small experimental data sets, so there's definitely data management um, and uh, integration expertise, modeling expertise required. Um, there is the individual or community developed legacy tools. Those are the bits that we have had before that needs to be integrated. Uh, and may, maybe others that can be integrated in the long term. Um, it's as I said, manage and interpret data. These are both uh, on the machine learning statistics side, but also on the data mo management side. Uh, modeling and simulation. And in a way, we need to build it so that we can communicate the outputs of this work. <coughs> And then there's the data lifecycle management, right? How do we store the data when it's active and people are working on it? Uh, like the Open Science Network, for instance, is going to g give us some capabilities, for instance, to do active uh, data storage. And then how do we manage that in the long term for these integrated products are reproducible um, and reusable? <coughs> and findable, of course, fair, findable, accessible, uh, it's not interoperable, what was I? Is it interoperable? Okay, and then reusable, right? Those are ours. Um, so there's problem solving going on here. Um, so there is that problem solving is data driven, heterogeneous, and collaborative in all kinds of ways. And this applies to many different problems that we are working on. There's a team. Oh, I should not do that. I should do it here. <laughs> Uh, they collaborate on algorithms, first in an exploratory way. Then what they explore, they either will rebuild it to scale it, or an alternative and a better way would be, what you explored with, you can scale that because you learned enough about it and you can use it in a uh, scalable way. And that runs on compute data network facilities on different systems. And while these going on, uh, we have documentation and support for teaching and other types of things, maybe to understand also the performance of these things that we are exploring with, so we can use it to scale them. Um, error and uncertainty quantification and things like that. Then um, we evaluate the outcomes based on what we learned there. Right? And maybe at some point you'll have a scientific discovery and it's gonna be published and archived and things like that. But the key thing is this whole thing constantly goes on and something needs to bring in institutional memory to this collaboration. Right? Because when you start collaborating, you actually become an implicit institution that needs to sustain itself with or without the same people. Because that's the way the information needs to carry on as well. <coughs> and here, I mentioned they have different data systems, on-demand distributed computing, high-speed connectivity. Uh, that's sort of becoming the future data systems, right? These days it's called the cloud, but even we can go beyond the cloud. Okay, the cloud has a distributed worldwide computing model, but you can even cross the boundaries of that with, you know, edge computing and things like that. That, may, that actually calls for the whole world to be our computer, right? That global supercomputer idea lives on in a way through the cloud and edge. And we need an ecosystem that then um, creates best practices for computing across these different scales and disciplines and makes things again data-driven, scalable, dynamic, process-driven because it's not going to be manual what we do in this type of uh, automated integration and collaborative. Um, so those bits on the 
left, I actually want to see them as technical, even the collaborative part. I'll explain why later on. And there's more um, process or uh, sort of business parts of it, right? We need to keep things accountable, reproducible, heterogeneous, and interactive. So these more of the soft parts of it. But again, we can do measurable things that helps us build those in a way they will be. So how do we create solution architectures for system integration that takes advantage of uh, infrastructure and services? Um, so just to summarize what we are trying to do then, there's some question, there's some data, there are some people. Uh, what they are doing goes through something. And remember, these were the X's and these are the Y's. There's some benefit through dashboards, visualizations, some interface that can be communicated. And in between, there's data management, data analytics, computational science, or business domain knowledge, or science knowledge, I would call it, and advanced infrastructure. And there needs to be some machinery that takes advantage of all of them and helps us integrate. What is that? Uh, when you look at that, whatever I said about best practices and what was in that multidisciplinary collaboration before, the heterogeneous system, data management approaches, methods, dynamic coordination and resource optimization. That's a part of that gears in that machinery. And collaborative culture and tools to manage that and create, help us to train skilled interdisciplinary workforce through these collaborations. Because all of these institutes and uh, new departments coming up, they're actually trying to do it in a way that integrates scientific disciplines or other parts of the university into the institute because that cross-cultural training needs to happen uh, for data science. It's very important. And there's a process, basic process, that when we do any solution, we acquire data, we prepare data, analyze it, report on it, and maybe store, act, publish it, do something like that. But in the past, some of these, maybe I could acquire a little bit of data and do something with it uh, in an exploratory way. Um, but now, when we talk about this exploratory thing, is to scale to many data streams uh, on different uh, volumes and things like that. Even the data acquisition needs to be done in a way it scales when we want to scale the application. And this continuous integration iteration, integration, and programmability of each step becoming, becomes important. We are now going to a world that we can automate these things. So then the main requirements for the system in, uh, operability from the integration point of view again is the dynamic composability. Can you take these legacy systems as services and dynamically compose those into applications that know about them? about their performance characteristics, scientific um, parameterization, or you know, uh, other types of accuracy needs. Um, and any legacy system in this case is useful if we can make groups of people integrate them uh, without having to need too much. You know? uh, so we can basically servicification of what we have in a way that's integratable or composable. And we also need, in this scenario, tools that enhance the teamwork, which is something that we sorely lack in today's infrastructure and computing systems. And they need to be coupled with AI-based approaches, like artificial or maybe data science approaches. I think the new world is AI, so I stuck it in there at some point for another talk. Um, so, what would that solution architecture look like? And this was my first attempt at drawing it, or many iterations of my first attempt happened. But definitely, the systems we have, GPU, CPU, network, storage, open, not open, secure, you know, all kinds of different modes of infrastructure, we need to treat them as composable. We can't think of the old model, we have an HPC cluster, and we'll do all our computations on it, and there's a storage associated to it. We'll move the data. We'll, you know, uh, we'll fetch, or we'll stage the computing, and then uh, put it back the data. That mode doesn't apply anymore, or that could be useful in some contexts, but we need to go beyond that, and that requires system composition, which is why 
cloud systems and that model become really uh, a, a, a big change. And on top of it, there needs to be some dynamic resource management. These days, the word is Kubernetes because you know Google built Org and Kubernetes is the open source version of that. And Kubernetes helps us to, for dynamic resource allocation if we know what we want from it. That requires us to understand our services to take advantage of it. Because otherwise, we won't be able to take full advantage of it. It becomes an overkill. On top of it, we need some services. The most typical service today, then when I say it, it's going to become more clear what I'm trying to say, I think, is a Jupyter Notebook. Right? Everyone's doing work in these notebooks. It becomes a bit isolated. But how do we move beyond that and take these notebooks as services that can interact with other notebooks? There's actually a number of uh, works going on that uh, area alone. Uh, but it could be anything else, right? It could be our HPC codes. It could be data management platforms, lots of different data storage. Actually, one of my colleagues is building what we called Awesome for social media data integration. But it's a poly store for a many other different data sets that we can take now advantage of graph store and a column store and uh, other forms of storage, NoSQL databases. And the also platform provides a layer on top of them so you can query across these different storage environments or um, data management systems, I would call them, um, without losing uh, performance. So it's almost like this native integration of many types of um, data stores into one. And we built interfaces on top of that and do some the graph analysis and other scenarios. Once you have those services, the role for workflow management systems, which is my area actually, becomes a little different than what we did before. It was just this coordination orchestration tool. But now we are talking about an operational um, research tool, right? Um, so operations research that optimizes what service is running where and what would be the most advantageous uh, based on the system integration scenario at hand. So we are treating a little bit that integration as the business of the scientific integration going on. And uh, that I think that's where we'll see workflow management systems evolve into. And some DOE circles even call this the workflow science now for that reason. Um, and then, but workflow management was anything underneath is useful for people working on it at that time uh, who know the details of it. But it's not useful when you're trying to move to different communities or a user community. That's why we see a rise in gateways. Uh, anything, I think, has a web front end these days is called a gateway. Um, and, but it could be other tools, right? maps, uh, web-based interfaces. Uh, so there needs to be something that yeah, integrates these into, uh, the, you, makes them useful. And what I talk about data lifecycle management and collaboration management is all parts of it. So what's composable? I talked about dynamic but systems, but for the biggest part of it will be measurement of these systems. Right? We need to have dynamic data or real-time data coming out of these systems to make those decisions. Right now, our HPC systems don't give us that uh, to a large extent. Um, for resource management to go right, you need mapping tools uh, for services to these systems that we know about the availability of. Composable services, um, just like containers, they probably run today as containers, the way we mean them. Um, but they expose a parameter interface for integration, and they are continuously measured and profiled themselves, so we can learn about them as we go through. And workflow management would be this resource optimization and coordination tool. And collaboration then focuses on here uh, the expertise integration and making sure everyone who needs to know anything about this resource and uh, composition scenario uh, needs to take be able to take advantage of it. And enabling interfaces is some sort of front end security, privacy, reproducibility, and data lifecycle management is like those long-term aspects of it that needs to start when we are doing the work, 
not afterwards. So then we need, first of all, those composable systems, dynamic read network compute storage uh, systems, and we need intelligent software to steer them. What would that intelligent software look like? That's my current area of research. I'm not gonna go through this a big deal, but I left some pointers there. We call this smart flows that we integrate data from a variety of resources and try to understand their behavior. And we also use it for what we call the PPODs tools. We treat each process as a part of the process, the integration sub-process sort of, as a service. And we work on them from the beginning. So we have actually a web interface that we start designing parts of the process. And we measure, start measuring on top of the systems about this process. And we use that as a part of these, you know, uh, collaborations that Larry Smar, uh, others, and I have been working on, the advanced infrastructure that Greenbit on compute, network, and storage. One of those systems is the Pacific Research Platform. Uh, this is the 100, um, 10 to 100 gigabit disk disconnectivity through UC campuses and some external partners through Scenic. Uh, through that, we were able to actually connect uh, some forms of storage and computing completely like a cloud across this 10 to 100 gigabit network. Um, and once you have something like that, um, you can compute on it with small devices as data streams to the storage uh, to do something with the data. And also, if it's not enough, you could of course integrate it into other cloud and let lake, long term data lake and other storage facilities. But most often, this is enough. Um, and a new grant, or semi new now, one and a half years old, Chase CI uh, was the software ecosystem, hardware and software ecosystem, to add more GPUs on this PRP infrastructure and build that co data composition collaboration interface, the software layer on top of that, which is some of those PPODs and smart flows tools are coming from. And the next step will be adding more types of resources uh, to s this network and see how it actually integrates uh, with what's, what other parts are available. One example is uh, this uh, streaming from a camera in the um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography Pier to PRP, uh, through the PRP to a GPU and doing constant plankton analysis. Before that, you know, this just wasn't there. There are lots of scientists who has this. They have some streaming data and it's really hard to find the facility is to work on it, but they can buy a GPU and stick it in here, like an instrument, and do their own computations. Another was uh, my students were working on some satellite data analysis for um, doing neural network-based vegetation uh, classification. And there also, we could do it in different platforms, but it just becomes too complicated. For me, it was having that 40 gigabytes of data storing it in one of these uh, and using what's available on the GPUs was good enough. So it really makes the students faster and they can deploy different tools and technologies a lot faster. Another set of students, they did cardiac MRI analysis on these GPUs um, and moved it back and forth to SDSC and Qualcomm Institute uh, where uh, the Fiona for the PRP actually sits. So again, these were my main requirements, right? The dynamic composability and others. Uh, and some other, I call it slightly distracting points, but I think this is also important. I think now we need to talk of this, the computing itself as a data-driven science. When we talk about data-driven science, but we didn't really make computing match that to a large extent because I understand <laughs> these are really massive changes in a large ecosystem. But one step at a time, like the PRP or these dynamic GPU network around the PRP, these show some effects of it already. We're now looking at integration of it with Exceed and we have a Jupyter hub that cuts across. So we are looking of, at ways of making at least the prototypes of that. And team integration and collaborative design needs to match this. We need those collaborative tools, like the PPODs is an example of it. I hope it's not gonna be the only example of it in the long term. 
that we can now look at collaboration as a measurable entity and people work with tools that actually helps them to collaborate and link to other services through that collaborative interface. And by the way, industry is doing this. <laughs> After we set this out, oh, I think I gave you a slightly earlier version of my slides. I didn't have three summary, I compiled them into one, but that's okay. Um, I can send the final for the final final. <laughs> Uh, for the records at least. But um, this is Netflix. Netflix has a notebook-based interface and they parameterize their notebooks. They have different personas in this uh, case. Uh, they're data managers, machine learning scientists, and you know other types of people who are working with the same infrastructure. Everything goes through notebooks that are scaled uh, in, through different tools. And these notebooks are integrated to create uh, impactful results. So any notebook that everyone design, anyone designs from their home, you know, these are people that are not in the same room even, goes through this interface and it becomes a part of the integrated solution that they are trying to create uh, to link to those business cases they are doing. Um, I, in my last version of the slides, there will be a link actually to Netflix blogs about this. They had two blogs on this infrastructure. And it's very similar to what I'm talking about in a smaller scale, right? Netflix is still one type of business with one type of need. But we need to, I think, think of also this type of collaborations for science. Um, thank you. I think I might be a few minutes over. <laughs> So questions? So that's a good question. Um, so PRP is available to the you know, West Coast community in a way. There are some arms of PRP international even. Uh, and Chase CI was mainly to do computer science research on machine learning through the GPUs on top of PRP. So that community who signed into JCI from the beginning is pretty much, in a way, set. But there's a Neve project. Uh, I wanted to add a slide on it, but I thought it would, I won't be able to describe it quite nicely yet. Um, there's a national RP uh, research platform that will um, link regional networks with uh, a network like PRP itself, so high-speed connectivity, and it will uh, build the similar measurement and prediction tools on that network. So uh, through that, I think through any regional, uh, folks can be a part of this infrastructure. So it's to carry it to the national scale. Uh, again, these are definitely working as production, but they're experimental platforms. Okay, any other questions? Let's thank LK again. <laughs>